Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your sacred Sabbath day of rest and for the blessings you have bestowed upon each and every one of us that have been here. We pray that you would give us once again an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say unto us as your church. And Father, open our hearts that we may discern clearly the events that have taken place and the repetition of history that is to take place that we may know clearly where we stand in history from your word, that we may point others to the truth for the time, that they be aroused to awake, that they may be found as faithful, wise virgins, and prepared for the Lord's coming. Bless us now and give us of thy spirit a double portion that we may truly hear and obey your words. In Jesus' precious name we thank you, and for your sake we pray. Amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath. We didn't quite get through the material last night, but uh, we did get through all the reading that I intended to do last night. But there was one other point I wanted to establish where we stopped, and it concerned what trumpets represent um, in Scripture. And you can see here from Numbers 10, 1 through 10, uh, that a trumpet. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver. And you'll notice in the red that they're for the calling of assembly. And if you drop down to the third paragraph of this passage, it's for an alarm. Trumpets, uh, the sanctuary trumpets, were for the calling of assembly and for the sounding of alarm. And they were, they were used within the worship service. In Leviticus 23, 24, trumpets were to announce a holy convocation. And uh, in Leviticus 25, 9 through 13, um, it was to sound the trumpet of Jubilee on the 10th day of the 7th month. Um, and of course, this is the, the trumpets of warning, the trumpets of gathering together, the trumpets of announcing a solemn assemble, assembly. And... Uh, as William Miller pointed out, the trumpets always signal the downfall of a kingdom. It's also a warning of a day of wrath. Zephaniah 1, 14 through 18. So we find trumpets uh, representing just a few things in Scripture. A call together, God's people together for worship, um, and a warning message and announcing the day of the Lord's wrath. Here's what William Miller had to say about a trumpet. In prophetical scripture, the sounding of trumpets is always used to denote the downfall of some empire, nation, or place, or some dreadful battle which may decide the fate of empires, nations, or places. At the fall of Jericho, the trumpet was the instrument in the hands of the priest of the mighty God Jacob, God of Jacob, which cast down her walls, destroyed the city, and cursed, and a curse pronounced against the man that should ever build up her walls again. Again, the trumpet was the instrument by which Gideon put to flight the armies of the aliens. And the prophet Amos says, Shall the trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? The last three trumpets will claim our attention in his discourse. The first four having their accomplishment under Rome pagan to the last three under Rome papal. These three trumpets and the three woes are a description of the judgments that God has sent and will send upon this papal beast, the abomination of the whole earth. Therefore we see the propriety of the language of our text, woe, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, meaning the worshipers of this papal beast, the followers of this abomination. The fifth trumpet alludes to the rise of the Turkish Empire under Ottoman and the downfall of the Saracens. Ottoman uniting under his government the four contending nations of Mohammedans which had long contended for the power during the reign of the Saracen Empire, the Saracens, Tartars, Arabs, and Turks. These all being by profession Mohammedans were ready to follow any daring leader to conquer and drive out from Asia and even make excursion into Europe, all who professed the Christian faith. They having embraced the errors of that fallen star Mohammed, whose principles were promulgated by conquest and sword, became one and perhaps the only barrier to, this, to the spread of the papal doctrine and the power in the Eastern world. Here the Roman church had long held a powerful sway over the minds and consciences of the Christian or Greek church in the East by the aid of the Eastern emperor at Constantinople. But the Turks or Ottomans, whom the Lord suffered to rise up in Bithynia, 
on or near the headwaters of the Euphrates as a scourge against this papal abomination now became a check to the Roman power, and from this time we may reasonably date the declension of papal authority. Therefore, on the sounding of the fifth trumpet, Rome papal began to show weakness, which in every succeeding age has been more and more manifested until her civil power has crumbled to ruin and her ecclesiastical assumption must sink at the sounding of the seventh trump to rise no more forever. And of course, we have to understand what William Miller's saying. He believed it all came to an end in 1843. So what we're saying here is that trumpets are, um, uh oh, symbolizing specific things in history. And as we go into our study of the trumpets, I think we'll find that all these things encompass um, the final trumpet, the third woe. <clears throat> but we're going to move to a next um, place. What I what I'm trying to do, so you'll know where I'm going. Um, Steve Dickey is going to speak after I speak here. I'm trying to put some um, thoughts in place for my next presentation where I hope to show how the first and second woe are in the realm of a triple application of prophecy and that the characteristics of these woes um, are illustrated in the last six verses of Daniel 11. So I want to put some some principles back in our mind. As I looked over my notes here, we have went over some of these principles this week, so this, in one sense, will be review. By the increase of knowledge, a people is be, be, to be prepared to stand in the latter days. They've paid homage to an institution of the papacy, making of no effect the law of Jehovah, but there is to be an increase of knowledge on this subject. We've talked about this a great deal. For me, this particular passage is telling us that there's going to be an increase of knowledge from Daniel's last vision that has to do with the papacy and the Sunday law, and therefore it is the increase of knowledge that's located in the last six verses of Daniel 11 that tell us that in 1989 the Soviet Union collapsed in fulfillment of verse 40, and the next thing to happen is a Sunday law in the United States. But Sister White continues on in this passage and says, All that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been, and all that is yet to come in its order will be. Daniel, God's prophet, stands in his place. John stands in his place. In the Revelation, the Lion of the tribe of Judah has opened to the students a prophecy, the book of Daniel. And thus is Daniel standing in his place. Where does the Lion of the tribe of Judah open the book of Daniel in the book of Revelation? Revelation chapter 10 comes down out of heaven with a little book open in his hand. Continuing on, he bears his testimony. Who bears his testimony? That which the Lord revealed to him in vision of the great and solemn events which, must, what, which we must know as we stand on the very threshold of their fulfillment, the great and solemn events which we must know as we stand on the very threshold of their fulfillment. In history and prophecy, the Word of God portrays the long-continued conflict between truth and error. That conflict is yet in progress. Those things which have been will be repeated. Old controversies will be revived and new theories will be continually arising but God's people, who in their belief and fulfillment of prophecy had acted a part in the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message, know where they stand. Where do they stand? Where do they stand? Where does God's people stand? Well, symbolically, they stand right there in the fulfillment of the first, second, and third angel's message as they re represent the fulfillment of the fourth angel's message at the end of time. It's that history where God's people stand in the prophecies. They have an experience that is more precious than fine gold there to stand firm as a rock holding the beginning of their confidence steadfast unto the end. The beginning all the way to the end. The upward look, page 37. The predictions of Daniel, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased, is to be fulfilled in our giving the warning of message. Now, you know, you can find passages in the spirit of prophecy where she identifies that the increase of knowledge was fulfilled in the pioneer time period. But here, she's taking that phrase and being very specific, it's fulfilled at the end of the world. Many are to be enlightened regarding the sure word of prophecy. Whatever this increase of knowledge is, it is categorized as the sure word of prophecy. Early writings, page 245, 247. I was shown the interest which all heaven had in taking in the work going on upon the earth. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel to descend and warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare for his second coming. Who is this angel? 
This is the angel of Revelation 10 that comes down to earth on August 11th, 1840. Second angel's message, but it's the same angel all the way from the year 1840 through. As the angel left the presence of Jesus in heaven, an exceeding bright and glorious light went before him. I was told that his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory and to warn men of the coming wrath of God. Multitudes received the light. Some of these seemed to be very solemn, while others were joyful and enraptured. All who received the light turned their faces toward heaven and glorified God. Another mighty angel was commissioned to descend to the earth. Jesus placed in his hand a writing, and as he came to the earth, he cried, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That's the first and second angel's message, which, I mean, if, if I think we have it in our notes a little bit farther on. Uh, these angels are representing the personage of Christ, but these angels are also representing the message, and these angels are also representing the people that proclaim the message. These are interchangeable uh, terms. Uh, Daniel 10, 1 through 3. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth, and he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voice. This is um, uh, the passage that we're going to deal with in this presentation and the next presentation. We're going to touch on it here, but this is a, a, an important point of reference, um, what we're going to be looking at in the next time I have opportunity to share. Um, this is from... Uh, Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 971. It says, After these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. These relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order. They're, these seven thunders are pointing to the future, their future events that will be disclosed. There are future events that will be made available for our understanding, and when they come, they will have a specific order. Daniel shall stand in his lot at the end of the days. Notice that she's taking the term out of Daniel, of standing in his lot, uh, that can be both applied um, to the Millerite time period, and when you apply it to the Millerite time period, what is the end of the days? It's the end of the prophetic days, the time prophecies that Miller and his associates came to understand. Daniel was standing in his lot at that time, but here she's tying Daniel into standing at the, in his lot once again at the end of the world. John sees the little book unsealed. Then Daniel's prophecy have their proper place in the first, second, and third angel's message is to be given to the world. The unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. What time? From 1840 to 1844. It was the message of the events that took place during that time. And it's that time of 1840 to 44 that is illustrating the time when God is going to accomplish that same experience among his people. It's taking place right now. The books of Daniel and Revelation are one. One is a prophecy, the other a revelation. One a book sealed, the other a book open. John heard the mysteries which the seven thunders uttered, but he was commanded not to write them. The special light given to John which was expressed in the seven thunders one of, was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angel's message. When was the first angel's message proclaimed? Or, or when did it arrive in history? 1840. Here's Sister White within two paragraphs of her saying that the seven thunders represent future events that will be disclosed in their orders. Two paragraphs later, she's saying the seven thunders symbolizes a delineation of events that took place from 1840 to 1844. They symbolize the same events in relation to time, the time when God would awaken the virgins and the experience would demonstrate which of the virgins were wise and which of the virgins were foolish. It was not best for the people to know these things, for their faith must necessarily be tested. In the order of God, most wonderful and advanced truths would be proclaimed. The first, second, first and second angel's messages were to be proclaimed, but no further light was to be revealed before these messages had done their specific work. 
This is represented by the angel standing with one foot on the sea, proclaiming with a most solemn oath that time should be no longer. There was special, there was a special increase of knowledge in the Millerite time period. That is when Daniel stood in his lot at the end of the days. Um, and this is all repeated. Manuscript releases, volume 13, page 334. I stated that I was a stockholder and I could not let the resolution pass that there was to be special light for God's people as they neared the closing scene of this earth's history. Another angel was to come from heaven with a message, and the whole earth was to be lightened with his glory. It would be impossible for us to say, ju state just how this additional light would come. It might come in a very unexpected manner, in a way that would not agree with the ideas that many had conceived. It is not at all unlikely or contrary to the ways and works of God to send light to his people in unexpected ways. In the 1840 to 44 time period, there was an angel that came down out of heaven and gave light to his people. And that time period when the angel come down and, and gave light to his people was symbolized by the seven thunders that John was told to seal up, but the seven thunders that John was told to seal up relate to future events that will be disclosed in their order, and sure enough, there's another angel that comes down during this time period, and once again, he's going to have a little book open in his hand, and that little book, once again, is going to be the book of Daniel. And when it comes down, the same experience that took place back then is repeated. When you reach the time period, when you can begin to understand the information that is the information of that little book that brings about this experience, then you know for a certainty that the angel has arrived. He's come down. This isn't a human work. This is the work of the Lord. When this book finally begins to unfold, you know you're there. Brothers and sisters, we're here. Amen. We're here. Sermons and Talks, Volume 1, page 225. Daniel has been standing in his lot since the seal was removed, and the light of truth has been shining upon his visions. He stands in his lot bearing his testimony, which was to be understood at the end of the days. And in this particular passage, to me, this seems more specific to the pioneer time period, the end of the days. What days? The 1260, the 1290, the 1335. At the end of those prophetic days, um, when that history arrived, Daniel, the book of Daniel, was standing in his lot. And uh, if you drop down, if you pass over the verses, Daniel 12, 10 through 13, and you see this quote, Manuscript Releases, Volume 6, page 108, Sister White defines what it means for a man to stand in his lot. When God gives a man a special work to do, he is to stand in his lot and place as Daniel did, ready to answer the call of God, ready to fulfill his, purposes, his purpose. When Daniel was standing in his lot in the Millerite time period, it means that the book of Daniel was going to fulfill its purpose during that history. And once again at the end of the world, Daniel will stand in his lot when the book of Daniel fulfills its purpose once again. And of course, Daniel 12, 10 through 13 says, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. By the way, we need to understand that this here is also a description of the time period 1840 to 1844, which the seven thunders symbolize. So that time period that both symbolizes the Millerite time period and the time that we're in right now, one of the characteristics that inspiration points to is that this is a time period of purification. Uh, there's a purification process going on at this time period, and the main tool for purification is light. When we are confronted with light, how we react to that light is determining whether we continue on in the light, or as we read early on, early on we read uh, some passages where we were dealing about the midnight cry, what happens to me? if I take my eyes off that light that's, that's the bright light of the midnight cry, I fall off the path into darkness. It's all about light. Will we receive the light? Will we not receive the light? That's the purification process that the wicked will not understand. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days 
Blessed he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and thirty-five days, but go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in the lot at the end of the days. Brothers and sisters, people that want to take the 1335 and place it at the end of the world in a day-for-day -day fashion, they don't realize that the 1335-day prophecy of Daniel 12 brings you to 1843. 1843 is a place that is representing a, a line in the sand in the the 1840 to 1844 time period that will be repeated here at our time period. And we, many times when we're sharing the truth about the Sunday law being the close of probation in Adventism, one of the, the discussions that comes out of that is, are you telling me that uh, the, our probation closes at the Sunday law in the United States? And the truth, your answer, if you're going to be specific about it, is no. Our character has to be prepared for the seal of God before the Sunday law. Someplace before the Sunday law, God's people that are going to stand for him and receive the seal of God at the Sunday law, they will have become fully settled into the truth spiritually, mentally, intellectually, completely so that they cannot be moved. And that is illustrated by 1843. The blessed hour, as Brother Russell's been uh, referring it to, they're ready to hit that final test somewhere before the Sunday law. If we're going to live during that time period if, as God's representatives, then we're going to reach the, the blessed hour that is prefigured by 1843. And we do not want to move that date that the pioneers so firmly established because it's one of the way marks that we need to understand for what it represents. Manuscript Releases, Volume 2, page 20. Blessed are the eyes which saw the things that were seen in 1843 and 1844. She's saying, blessed are the people that were there in 1843. That's when the 1335 day prophecy came to pass. The message was given. And there should be no delay in repeating the message for the signs of the times are fulfilling. The closing work must be done. A great work will be done in a short time. A message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into the loud cry. Not the midnight cry. At the end, it's the loud cry. Then Daniel will stand in his lot to give his testimony. If you remember the story I told about the brother that insists that... Um, Daniel, or 1 Corinthians 10, 11 was all these things happened to them as examples. And he said they're just moral examples. You don't bring the history down to the end of the world. This is the quote that I read him. It says, I says, brother, it says right here, a message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. Then Daniel will stand in his lot. Are you telling me that this isn't saying that Daniel stands in his lot at his, at, at his last days? And he says, oh, Brother Jeff, you know as well as I do that Sister White's a careless writer. That's, that's where our conversation ended. Brothers and sisters, this is saying there's a message at the end that is the loud cry message, and when it arrives, Daniel stands in his lot. How? He's there to fulfill his purpose. The book of Daniel has light that brings this experience about Daniel stands in his lot at the end of the world, just as he stood in his lot in the Millerite time period. The attention of the churches must be aroused. We are standing upon the borders of the greatest event in, in the world's history. By the way, how, how do you think the attention of the churches get, could get aroused? Controversy over this message. You take this message and you start sharing it, and you're going to get some controversy thrown in your face. But you know what it just said? The churches must be aroused. Unfortunately, because it isn't fun, but it is the Lord's ordained method. The attention of our churches must be aroused. We are standing upon the borders of the greatest event in this world's history, and Satan must not have power over the people of God, causing them to sleep. The papacy will appear in its power, and all must now arouse and search the Scripture, for God will make known to his faithful ones what shall be in the last time. The word of the Lord is to come to his people in power. <clears throat> Bible prophets are representative men. They are used to illustrate God's people at the end of the world. We've touched on this before. 
I want to touch on it briefly here again. Isaiah 8.18, Behold I, this is Isaiah speaking, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. The prophets are used to illustrate God's people at the end of the world in many passages of Scripture. And if we read simply the prophetic message and do not pay attention to how the prophets themselves are being employed in the scenes, then we're missing a great deal of light. Signs of the Times, January 13th, 1898. The patriarchs and prophets were representative men, and through them, from century to century, a flood of knowledge was poured into the world. The, the characters of the Bible are representative men. They can be understood as sending information through the prophetic testimony. As an example, turn with me, if you would, to Zechariah. I, I, don't, I seem to have left that off the bottom, but that's the book of Zechariah. And uh, let's remind ourselves where Zechariah is in history. He's one of the prophets that's participating in what work? The rebuilding and restoration of Jerusalem. Here's a prophet that is active during the time that the children of Israel have come out of Babylon. And what are they doing? They're rebuilding the temple. Now you, you tell me. As Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world, if I was to bring from behind the board... Right now, um, a seven-pronged golden candlestick, what would you tell me that was? Without, without much questioning, what is that? That's, that's the lamp in the holy place of the sanctuary, right? We know that. We've all studied enough. Shouldn't a prophet understand the furnishings of the sanctuary at the very time period that they're rebuilding the sanctuary? Wouldn't you think a prophet would know the furnishings? Let's read this. Verse 1. And the angel, this is Zechariah, and the angel that talked with me came again and waked me. Now notice, he, Zechariah uh, woke up as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold with a bowl on the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, Zechariah, ah, I cut and pasted, that Zechariah doesn't belong to the text, that Zechariah there in the middle should be down in front of the four. And the two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other on the left side thereof. So I answered and spake unto the angel that talked with me, saying, what are these, my Lord? Zechariah doesn't even know what the seven um, pronged, golden candlestick is a prophet of the Lord in the time that they're rebuilding the temple. You think that's logical? I don't. Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. When you look at this passage, you'll notice that in the previous chapter, it's the, the portrayal of Joshua and the angel. Chapter 3 that leads into this, and Sister White says in several places that chapter 3 uh, of Zechariah is identifying the very closing scenes of Christ's work in the most holy place now, at this time. It's obvious, if you read the whole chapter, Zechariah, that this is an illustration of Adventism at the end of the world. And what kind, where at, what part of Adventism at the end of the world? This isn't an illustration of the 144,000. This is an illustration of the Millerite movement that are awakened, um, all the virgins are awakened, and then comes the great disappointment. And what didn't the Adventist, or the Millerite Adventists, not understand during that time period? They didn't understand the sanctuary. They're awakened, the great disappointment comes, and they need to come to grips with what the sanctuary is. And Zechariah is illustrating God's people at the end of the world and God's people at the end of the world include both the Millerites and us. Isaiah 6, 5 through 7. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tong, with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Sister White says very clearly 
that this is the experience that everyone in this room needs to have if they're going to be among the 144,000. Isaiah is giving an example of God's people at the end of the world that have been purified from the coals off the altar. Zechariah, Isaiah, Ezekiel are representative men representing God's people at the end of the world. Ezekiel 24, 15 through 23. Thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign. According to all that he hath done shall ye do. And when this cometh, ye shall know that I am the Lord God. The prophets are signs. Daniel. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known unto him the interpretation. Is Daniel simply a historical figure as Babylon comes tumbling down? Daniel is representing God's people that at the time when Babylon is falling, it's at the very end, the handwriting's on the wall, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. In that scenario is Daniel representing the people at the end of time that have an understanding of the fall of Babylon in this crisis time. The prophets are used to illustrate God's people at the end of the world. Of course, we've read this several times, Daniel 12, 3 and 4. And, the, and they that be wise, the wise virgins, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Hosea 4, 6, the other side, the flip side to this coin. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. This is serious information when we're dealing with the increase of knowledge that the wise understand and that the foolish reject. Then I, Daniel, looked. And behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was on the waters of the river, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? Now notice uh, that Daniel, what he's seen leading up to this interaction is the climax of Daniel's last vision. He's just seen Daniel 11, 40 to 3. Through 45 and Daniel 12, 1 through 3. And the question is, how long shall be the end of these wonders? Okay, but we're going to move beyond that. Next verse, verse 7, I believe. If we want to get the verse in place. Verse 7, And I heard the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he has, shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? We've talked about this once in the school already. But here's Daniel not understanding this time prophecy here. The que a, a, a new question is raised. The first question is, what's the end of these wonders? And I submit to you that the wonders that just ended were the last six verses of Daniel 11 and the first three verses of Daniel 12. That's the wonders. But now we're into another question. What's this time prophecy? I don't understand this time prophecy. He says, and I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And we remember the very starting of Daniel's last vision in verse 1 of Daniel 10, which says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. The first thing we are told about Daniel's last vision, and it's doubled is that he understood the thing, he had understanding of the vision, but when we get over here to Daniel 12, which is the same vision, from verses, verses 7, 8, um, 9, 7 and 8, 
Daniel doesn't understand, and I submit to you that here Daniel is not creating a contradiction in God's word. Here, Daniel is representing God's people at the end of the world, but he's representing that group of God's people at the end of the world that did not understand the time prophecies, but had a burden to do so. And that's the Millerite movement. The Millerite movement were the ones that did not understand the time prophecies. But I also submit to you that we have two questions raised there. And the people at the end of the world are going to be the ones symbolized which shall be the end of these wonders. The 144,000, their increase of knowledge will be the wonders, not the time prophecies. And we went through this, but for those of you that haven't been here, we, I submit to you that the first part of Daniel 10 is Daniel illustrating God's people here and now. We've read verse 1, where Daniel understood the thing and he had to understand the visions. And one of the things that Daniel is symbolizing about God's people at the end of the world is that they will understand Daniel's last vision. And by the way, that is the first characteristic noted in this passage. And then it says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all. Until three whole weeks were fulfilled. We, brothers and sisters, are in the time period where we are to be fasting and mourning because we are to be entering in to the Day of Atonement by faith. And this is the call of the Day of Atonement. And Daniel is representing those people at the end of the world that are standing during the time period when the investigative judgment is in process. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the great river, which is Hittacol, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man, clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face his appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude." And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Brothers and sisters, as we've said earlier in this prophecy school, Daniel is here representing God's people at the very end of time, that they understand Daniel's last vision, because that's where the increase of knowledge comes from. They're living in the time period of the investigative judgment. That's why he's fasting and mourning for a specified time. But every one of those people is going to have their own personal confrontation with Jesus Christ. It can't be intellectual. It has to be experienced. And that's what Daniel is symbolizing here. He's symbolizing God's people that have that experience with Christ. And it is noted in the passage that this experience with Christ is offered to the whole church to the wise and foolish virgins. But the foolish virgins, all that happened with them is a quaking or a shaking made them flee. Therefore I was left alone and I saw this great vision. The Lord purifies His church and there remained no strength in me. The 144,000 will have allowed all of their human strength to be crucified on the cross of Calvary and they will be fully empowered by the Holy Spirit. And in me, for my comeliness was turned into me corruption and I retain no strength. And the truth of inspiration says that the closer we come to Christ, the more corrupt we look in our own eyes. And Daniel is symbolizing this truth about this experience, which prophecy demands of anyone that's going to be among the wise 144,000 virgins at the end of time. The premise, the, the, the theme of Daniel's last vision is here, verse 14. Now I have come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Brothers and sisters, Daniel's last vision gives us a portrayal of 
what happens to God's people in the latter days. And what happens to God's people in the latter days is first, the Millerite movement is raised up with a burden to understand time prophecy and there's an increase of knowledge and they go through a purification process that culminates in 1840 to 1844. And as they go through that process, they fulfill the parable of the ten virgins to the very letter, setting forth a pattern of what takes place with God's people at the end of time. All the characteristics are in place. And we know that prophets are used this way. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And I want to point out before I read through here, it's in this chapter, it's in this description of history where the seven thunders are healed up, sealed up. And we've already read where Sister White says that these seven thunders represent a delineation of events that transpired under the first and second angel's message, and they also represent future events that will be disclosed in their order. So in this chapter, we already have one testimony that the pioneer time period is fulfilled again to the very letter, and here... John is emphasizing this truth one more time in the same book, not through a, a prophecy, but through him being a representative man of God's people at the end of the world. And it says, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. Hey, have you ever thought, have you ever studied what it means to eat the little book up? I, you know, I... I uh, this, if, if, if there's a rebuke in this, this isn't, this isn't meant to be a rebuke at all, but if, it's a re, if there's a rebuke in this, it's for me, okay? Don't listen to it as a rebuke. But I listen to someone like Brother Russell taking all these histories that are prefiguring the end of the world, and, you know, he has the ability to reach out and grab ten of them at one time and be bouncing back and forth of them, and I'm back and forth with him, and I'm having to just... Just swim to try to keep up with him. And I, can, I can keep up with him. I can tell as he walks through him, yeah, that's right. And he brings it here, and I can say, yeah, that, that's really good. But, but I haven't quite yet got it where I could do that. But you know something? There's no excuse for that. Because I'm supposed to take the little book and eat it up and make it my own, and I'm supposed to understand these things. Amen. Take it up, take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but in sh it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again. Even here, the repetition of the experience is pointed forward to. What shall be the end of these wonders? I'm submitting to you that the wonders, the question here isn't the time prophecies that symbolize the pioneer movement. The wonders are the last six verses of Daniel 11 and the first three verses of Daniel 12. And the wonders that I want to emphasize here in bringing this to a close in order to refresh our minds with them for my, the presentation that we're going to do next, that I'm going to do next, is the history of these verses because I, we need to have them fresh in our mind because we are going to try to take the little book of Daniel and bring it together with the trumpets of Revelation just like the message of the trumpets in the pioneer time period was brought together with the book of Daniel, only different. Just like, but different. <laughs> it's not the same, but it's a connection between the two books. And before we get there, I want to suggest to you that these are the wonders. Daniel 11, verse 40, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Daniel 11, verse 41, a Sunday law in the United States. And each one of these, these summaries of these verses carry a mountain of information with it. These, this is simply a summary. Verses 42 and 43 of Daniel 11. The deadly wound of the papacy is healed. Verses 44 and 45. The final fall of Babylon. Praise the Lord. Verse 1 of Daniel 12. The close of human probation. The great time of trouble. And the special resurrection just 
before the return of Christ. Switch gears. The number 12. Revelation 12, 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. I'm su suggesting here that 12 is a number associated um, with God's kingdom. And we know this is Matthew 10, 1 through 7. And when he had called in to him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manners of sickness and all manner of diseases. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these, they're named, these 12 Jesus sent forth. These 12 represent the Christian church. Acts of the Apostle, page 19. As in the Old Testament, the 12 patriarchs stood as representatives of Israel, so the 12 apostles stands as representatives of the gospel church. 12, 12. Acts of the Apostles, page 19. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. As in the Old Testament, the twelve patriarchs stood as representatives of Israel, the twelve apostles stand as representatives of the gospel church. See also, you can see the quotes under there, where twelve is a number that is associated with God's kingdom. We've, we've read this earlier, the covenant that the Lord entered into with Abram, promising to make him the father of many nations. And then here we have a list of the 12 um, descendants that we call Israel in general. Genesis 35, 22 through 26. Here we have the blessing which is, was a prophecy about the role that the 12 tribes of Israel would play at the end of time. Uh, this is from Genesis 49, verses 1 through 28. What I want to hit more than reading all the prophecies is this opening verse. It says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I, am, I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. These blessings were predictions about the role of Israel in the last days. Patriarchs and Prophets Page 235, at the last all the sons of Jacob were gathered about his dying bed, and Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Often and anxiously he had thought of their future and had endeavored to picture to himself the history of the different tribes. Now as his children waited to receive his blessing, the spirit of inspiration rested upon him, and before him in prophetic vision, the future of his descendants was unfolded. One after another, the names of his son were mentioned. The character of each was described, and the future history of the tribes were, was briefly foretold. Ishmael was Abram's, Abraham's firstborn. Now, he wasn't the heir of the covenant. He wasn't heir to the blood lineage um, that was going to preserve um, the line of Christ, but he was a son of Abraham. And you'll notice that in Genesis 17, verse 20, it says, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Notice the number 12 is associated with Ishmael, and you can see those 12 princes in Genesis 25, 12 through 16. Here is a, a touchy piece of ground. <laughs> we're, we're, we're in a touchy piece of ground if you're listening to what Russell was saying this morning. I personally believe that Islam came out of the bottomless pit. Therefore, it's a satanic power. Okay, But I do believe that Islam is traced back through the lineage of Ishmael and that it has had a connection with God's people from that time, a very direct connection. Abraham is their father. But I think that they have to be understood 
in the terms of how they're going to fulfill Bible prophecy first and foremost. Um, so, I recognize for myself that there is also a prophecy about Ishmael that is similar to the prophecy to the 12 tribes. Now, now some people may say that the prophecy here we're going to look at about Ishmael, well, this is, this is just a... This isn't a, a prophecy in the same sense of the 12 descendants uh, of, of Jacob because this is a negative prophecy. Well, go read the 12, the 12 promises to Jacob's sons and they're not all glowing. You know, it's, it qualifies. The number 12 lets you know there's some kind of relationship to God's kingdom that the descendants of Ishmael have. But anyway, let's read this. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Brothers and sisters, I'm, I, understand, I don't know if I understand it exactly like Russell, but everything he said this morning, if you heard, I say amen to everything, everything. I may have a, a different understanding of some heritage of Ismael. I may have the exact. I don't know. But I believe that this is predicting that the descendants of Ishmael will be the catalyst for the one world order, that they're going to be wild and crazy men, and their hand will be against every man, and they will create an issue that will bring every man's hand against them. Of course, I also believe that once every man's hand comes against them, we're going to see that the Pope of Rome wasn't really after them. He then, when he has the power back, he turns on God's people, Seventh-day Adventists. So I understand the descendants of Ishmael to be a power from the bottomless pit, that is used to bring the final uh, movements of end time prophecy together. They're used to bring the beast, dragon, and false prophet together. And there will come a time in, in earth's history when you should see the descendants of Ishmael begin to fulfill that role. And I think that's consistent with what we're going to share with what we looked at last night on the, the trumpets and what we're going to share about the third woe later on today. Patriarchs and Prophets 173-174. Abraham's early teachings had not been without effect upon Ishmael, but the influence of his wife's resulted in establishing idolatry in his family, separated from his father and embittered by the strife and contention of a home destitute of the love and fear of God. Ishmael was driven to choose the wild, marauding life of the desert chief, his hand against every man and every man's hand against him. In the latter days, he repented of his evil ways and returned to his father's God. But the stamp of character given to his posterity remained. The powerful nation descended from him were a turbulent heathen people who were ever an annoyance and affliction to the descendants of Isaac. For me, I believe that uh, the prophet Muhammad, Muhammad, so-called prophet Muhammad, however you want to articulate that, was a descendant of Ishmael, and he was used to bring about a religion that was from the bottomless pit that was initially to be the scourge against an apostate church and Eastern Rome. And in this action, uh, he is a descendant of Ishmael, fulfilling the prophecy of Ishmael. But more than that, he's pre prefiguring what brings modern Babylon to its knees and creates the environment that puts this whole end time scenario together. I know one of the points of contention on this subject is who and what Muhammad was. Some people want to identify him as strictly a satanic instrument from beginning to end. Others have a, perhaps a different perspective. And right now, for me... <laughs> I know the perspectives that I'm talking about in a general sense of the word, but I'm kind of on the fence. I'll tell you why I'm on the fence. When I first started approaching this subject, I knew nothing about it. And the first thing that came to my mind was the story of Balaam. 
And Balaam is in the line of Ishmael. And Balaam is a prophetic figure that is used to illustrate the end of the world in a variety of ways. And Balaam was a false prophet. But in the beginning, Balaam wasn't a false prophet. He lost his way. So I can see a little bit of wiggle room for who and what Muhammad is. But for me, that isn't where the issue is. Just like I don't believe the conspiracy theories about what took place at Waco or Oklahoma or the Twin Towers is where the issue is. The issue is Bible prophecy. And Bible prophecy is teaching, in my understanding, that the satanic force, and I call it satanic force because it's a force out of the bottomless pit, the satanic force that has a role to play to bring the United States to the Sunday law and bring on the one world order is radical Islam. And that's what we need to understand the here and now is what radical Islam is doing today and based upon the history. I'm not saying we shouldn't understand the history. So with that being said, that's, that's a little bit of what I'm understanding some of the things being said about Ishmael and the third woe, and I've set the, the platform that I need to set for my next presentation, I hope. So let's um, bow together in prayer if you would. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for a week of coming together and considering the prophetic information that you've set forth for this hour, and we're come bringing to a conclusion here today, um, and we ask that you'd continue to give us your presence, your Holy Spirit, your angels, as you have throughout the week, so that this Sabbath day can be um, a double blessing, and that we can continue to um, learn things that you would have us understand um, at this time in earth's history. We, I also ask that you would once again uh, put a conviction on each and every heart here that what we are hearing we need to um, test by your word and through prayer uh, when we get home. We realize that we haven't had extra time to be running down a search on everything that's been said here, but put it on our heart and mind that we need to uh, go back through what we've heard and, and test it and evaluate it and keep it if it's valid and reject, if it, it, reject it if it isn't. Um, and we thank you once again for the, the easy times that we have to come together and consider these things. In Jesus' name, amen.